The title of the talk is Strange Saga Number Theory. We'll dinner afterwards. Contact me after the talk. Okay, it's my pleasure to be giving a second talk here. Uh, the, the two talks that I, uh, which I gave abstracts, uh, I, I, well, I should say the two abstracts for the two talks were written so that it sound essentially isomorphic or identical. The talks are actually quite different, although they have a parallel in the sense that both began uh, roughly when I was 16 years old. And um, each of them was then continued at some, well, a certain exploration that went on for a while um, with sort of different degrees of intensity for several years, and then sort of faded out. And then it, uh, it, was, it came back uh, into existence um, or into, into my world uh, some either one, two, or three decades later. And so, uh, and, and in strange, a strange way, both cases with somebody whose first name was Greg or Gregory. Uh, and so, yesterday was Greg Huber, today is Gregory Wanya, my advisor in physics. All right, so I'm going to begin by talking about some stuff that I did when, I, as I said, I was about 16. And I, got, I was very excited by number theory. And I was uh, persuaded that I was going to be uh, a number theorist, and uh, my first exploration in this domain was uh, actually triggered by a question that was posed to, be, to me by a, uh, a New Jersey mathematician, who some of you may know, John Mather of the Princeton University Math Department. John and I were friends when we were little children, because I grew up partly in Princeton, and then we lost track of each other for a while. But in our teens, we got back in touch and we exchanged letters and he asked me some questions about triangular numbers. And that got me interested in the nature of triangular numbers. And, um, and so here is just a picture to remind you of the standard fact that the nth triangular number is n times n plus 1 over 2, a quadratic number. Um, and uh, for reasons that I don't actually recall, I asked myself the question, what is the distribution of the triangular numbers uh, relative to the squares? So uh, I wrote out, and this was all done originally by hand, and then it was done using a Frieden calculator, one of those mechanical, pseudo semi electronic, not electronic, electrical chugging computers or calculators uh, back in the, this was in 1961. So I've written the triangular numbers in. Uh, red and the squares in blue, and uh, just giving you a sense that what I was interested in, is, in knowing is what is the distribution of triangulars relative to the squares. So there are two in this in this interval. I, I would draw my line right there, my barriers just to the left, but they coincide, like with 36, I would put it to the left. And so there are two here, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, one, two, and so forth. Um, now, uh, I calculated this sequence out for quite a long distance. And, uh, and so here are some terms of it. And uh, I could see, uh, I was being very empirical in, you know, in the same spirit of uh, yet, as yesterday's talk. I was doing a lot of empirical stuff. I also did you know, some proofs. But at the beginning, I was generally guided just by my interest in patterns. And so I was looking for patterns, and I wasn't trying. I mean, of course, I did write down the formula for the nth, nth term of the sequence, but the formula wasn't transparent. And so um, I then started looking at the, uh, at the sequence itself uh, to see if I could find some uh, some property with it. By the way, that, that, that little comment anticipates something of interest, which is uh, an interest in numbers uh, as opposed to trying to manipulate formulas, which is which comes back later in this talk. It is something that uh, served me well in my later in my later incarnation. So, um, if you if you look at this now, admittedly today. People are familiar with the kinds of structure that I discovered at that time in such a way that they're going to be much less surprised than I was. 
But for me, my, there was an immense amount of surprise when I found some structure here. Firstly, it didn't seem to be periodic. And if you look at it, try to find the periodicity, you'll find that it doesn't have any. Um, and, um, but uh, I naturally, my eye was drawn to the fact that the sequence was, was uh, consisted of, I mean, this is a visual phenomenon, you understand, was sort of what you could call 211s and 21s. That's how my eye picked up on it. And so, um, for reasons that are obscure to me now, uh, what I did was I, I sort of put circles around the 211s in my mind, or on paper, I would really do it. And then I looked at what was in between the 211s. And here there was a 21 and 21, here's a 21, here's a 21 and 21, and so forth. And and the obscure thing that is, uh, I don't know quite why I did it, I wrote four here, meaning there's two, one, two, one. And then two, one, I wrote two. And then two, one, two, one, I wrote four again. So I came up with a, a, what I call a derivative sequence. And uh, the derivative sequence was composed of fours and twos. And I, I looked at it for quite a while. And, uh, and uh, after a long time, it occurred to me that I could divide it by two. Uh, <laughs> and when I divided it by two, I found that it was two, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one, two. One, one, two. I found the exact same sequence as, as, uh, as, the, as this original sequence. And it took me a, a couple of days of, of intense exploration to find this. Now, at the time I was doing this, 1961, Stanford University, which is where I was, had one computer. They didn't really own it. It was owned by a bank in San Jose. And Stanford was allowed to use it uh, in the evenings and overnight. And uh, in the, it was in the comp center, as they called it. And a friend of mine, uh, who was about my age, knew how to program. He taught me how to program in Algol. And uh, it was a Burroughs 220 machine. And um, it was in the basement of an old rundown building, if you know Stanford, in Sina Hall. Stanford. Anyway, it was in an obscure place on campus, and virtually nobody knew about its existence. I, I was one of the handful of people who frequented the comp center uh, in the basement of Encina Hall. And, um, and so I would ask the computer to calculate terms of sequences and to verify hypotheses for me, and I did it uh, very passionately for several years. And this was, of course, the first one. And uh, it was uh, extremely exciting to me. Um, and uh, eventually, I did prove this result, although it took quite a while uh, to prove it, because a lot of things had to happen before I was able to reach that point. Um, so uh, I was interested, after I had done this, in finding and having the same experience again. I wanted to. Uh, you know, as mathematicians always do, they want to generalize and they want to find a larger pattern of which the original pattern is only the tip of the iceberg, you might say. And so, um, so I, uh, I thought to myself, well, triangles and squares, what the obvious generalization is pentagonal numbers, and, uh, and so uh, there's a natural way to, to write down pentagonal numbers. You can think of it algebraically or geometrically if you think of it. Uh, algebraically, the differences, uh, the second differences of the first sequence are one, the second differences of the second sequence are two, the second differences of the third sequence are three, that is, four, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen, etc. However, you want to think about it, uh, you get some more, uh, you get a new family of uh, polygonal, polygonal numbers for any n. And so then it occurred to me, you know, to try to count, well, I wasn't sure if I wanted to count triangulars between pentagonals or squares between pentagonals or what. And I tried it out, and uh, I got sequences that were somewhat similar, but they didn't have the property, uh, at least I wasn't, open. I didn't discover any property that would show something being equal to its own derivative. Uh, and, and so I was, you know, I was hunting around for more variations. I mean, this is my first set of variations. But then I went out um, uh, in, in different directions. I decided to replace the plus signs by time signs. And I, I did it again. And I got uh, twos and ones again. And, uh, 
and uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't somehow. Oh, I see. O F F stands for odd number product factorial factorial odd number product factorial factorial. And so I got pages and pages of output that looked like this. And, uh, and, I, and I wrote this little poem, rows after rows, and troughs after troughs, of f's after rows, and of's after offs. Um, and uh, again, I, I, it, there was a lot of pattern, but not enough. And I, there wasn't anything like the properties that I found the first time. And so uh, I kept on looking for more. I, I reached out into other areas of semantic space, you might say, trying to generalize. Um, and the next one was um, counting powers of two between powers of three. And uh, that one was actually, the formula was easy to find because the number of powers of two below any number is the greatest integer, that's the floor function in log to the base two of the number. And so the number of powers of two between two between x and y is, is, is this. And if uh, y is a power of two, then simplify it to get this expression, where alpha is log to the base 2 plus 3. And, uh, and so I got, uh, this was the, the nature of the sequence that, that this, uh, this is the algebraic nature of the sequence that this uh, operation gave me. And so uh, although you may not be able to read this, it will give you a sense for it anyway. The top line consists of 1s and 2s uh, in which 2s are more frequent. Uh, then the second line it consists of where I'm counting the number of twos in between ones. In other words, the ones occur only isolated. And the twos occur in variable amounts. The twos occur either doubly or singly. And so the, the second line, which is in red, I don't know if you can see it or read it. Can you read it at all? Some of you, anyway. Uh, the second line consists also of ones and twos, but it's not by any means the same sequence. Um, but in the second line, uh, the twos are more, the twos are the rare ones, and the ones are the common ones. Uh, so the roles are reversed. And I did it again, I counted the more frequent ones between the isolated ones, and that gave me the third line, which is in light blue. And it's again consisting of ones and twos, but tantalite, like, even though it is, it's nothing related to the previous two sequences. Uh, and now the ones uh, uh, occur in, uh, well, you can see it for yourself. I, I don't want to narrate this down to infinite detail. What's interesting is that finally, on the fourth iteration of taking this kind of a derivative, I wound up with some sequences that weren't composed of ones and twos, but of threes, and I don't know actually what, what the next number is. It might be fours. Uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's some integer, and it's three and either two or three and four. Uh, and uh, what I saw here, was that I was sort of getting into a, um, this, this idea of taking the derivative was a very interesting idea. Taking the derivative of a sequence that was of this form, and it looked as if it was another sequence of this form, and as if I could continue taking derivatives forever. Now, what's interesting to me, what I remember extremely vividly at, at this time, I want to my next transparency is in my, Um, I remember I went to my mentor, uh, Gordon Latta at Stanford. He was, uh, what's going on? I went the wrong direction. I went to my mentor, Gordon Latta, and I asked him, uh, I told him about what I was doing. He was very supportive. He said it was very interesting. And I had this formula, the k plus 1 times alpha floor of minus k times alpha floor of. And I said, um, where, where alpha, by the way, was log to the base 2 of 3. Alpha was a particular constant. And, um, and I said, I think what the, I, I have to explore, you know, log to the base k of n instead of log to the base 2 of 3. And the reason I did that was that I was a very discrete kind of a person, ETE, not EET. And, um, and the origin of my exploration had been in counting powers of one integer between powers of another integer. And so it occurred to me, so the way I perceived the expression log to the base 2 of 3 was that it was a function of two integers. It was a function of two integers. And that's how I perceived it. Well, when Gordon looked at it, 
you perceive log to the base two of three uh, totally differently. You just said that's a real number. He just saw it's a real number. He said, just let it be any real number. And of course, actually, when you think about it, it sort of, it, it sort of makes sense because the, the logarithms of so, the, the, the expression, the, the set of numbers that are formed log to the base k of n is dense on the real line. So you might, I mean, essentially, you get almost every real number anyway, but you don't get it. It's countable, but what I mean is you get uh, cl arbitrarily close to any real number, so you might as well just let let it uh, consider for all real numbers. And that was, for some reason, I don't know if I would ever have thought of that idea, but he, he suggested it. And so uh, that was a takeoff point for me. So now alpha became an arbitrary real number. Actually, I was mostly interested in irrational numbers, not, not rational. Um, because then the derivatives would go on forever. If you did it for rationals, the derivatives petered out at certain point. So um, I just am going to make a couple of definitions. The C of A um, is the closest, closest integer to alpha. So let's take as our example uh, pi. So if alpha is pi, then the closest to the count, as I call it, C of A to count is 3. And S of A, S of alpha, uh, this is the second closest integer, which is two integers that surround the, the, the number. So that's 4. So uh, those are the two numbers. Uh, that uh, the sequence is always composed of. And it, it, the set, as I called it there, I called it that because it's a separator. It always occurs I, I, isolated. Whereas the count is the thing that occurs in different uh, clump lines. And so uh, you count the number of counts between steps and you get a new way to sequence. So uh, here's just some examples. So you take pi, the count is 3, the set is 4, you take e, the count is three and the set is two, and so forth. All right, so the, one of the first things that I... So you have a question? Yeah, oh, I was just saying, how do you take step of an integer? Because the second closest... Oh, well, I don't worry about exceptional cases. Sets of measure zero, like integers. I was only concerned with the irrational. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you can always... I mean, effectively, what happens is at the end, you wind up with a theta sequence that's sort of trivial, just like pi, 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 and that's not very interesting. I was only interested in ones that had, could be di differentiated forever. So, um, so this is just showing what I just said, effectively, that the, the, the steps, which are in blue there, occur uh, isolatedly. The counts occur in groups of different lengths. And in fact, the derivative sequence has, is, is another eta sequence of, the, well, I call this one eta of alpha. Eta of alpha is that expression, k plus 1 times alpha raised integer minus k alpha greatest integer. Um, so that's an eta sequence. And so the top one is an eta sequence belonging to some unknown thing. The second one is also an eta sequence. So the derivative of an eta, the eta sequence belonging to alpha is the eta sequence belonging to alpha prime, where alpha prime is derived from alpha by this simple formula. The sep minus alpha over alpha minus the count, which basically is just saying, here's the two integers flanking alpha, and you just take the distance to each of its neighbors, and integer neighbors, and you take that ratio, and uh, it's always at least one. And if it's irrational, uh, it's always greater than one. Okay. So uh, that gave me, uh, that gave me this, now this whole world to explore what happens when you take um, derivatives of a given real number. Um, now, so that's what I call the vertical structure. So from alpha, you derive the count and the set. From the top row, then you can derive alpha prime, from which you can get the count and the set of that. And then you can get the third row, and you can get the fourth row, and you can continue indefinitely. Um, and uh, so I wanted to explore this, being an empirical math person. Uh, I decided, well, I just need some examples. It's sort of trivial. It turns out that the, uh, when it's the square root of 2, the derivative is its, this a to sequence derivative is, the, is also belongs to the square root of 2. It just immediately gives itself back. Um, and so the count sequence vertically is just all ones, and the sub sequence is all twos. You might. Uh, 
ask how frequent that is. Well, for the golden ratio, it's the reverse. For the golden ratio, the counters are always two. That is, phi is always equal to phi prime, phi double prime, phi triple prime. They're all the same. They're all, the, they're all phi. And so the counts are all two and the steps are all one. And in that sense, the square root of two and phi are complementary numbers. One the step column of one is the count column of the other. Right? Nice to so. Okay. Um, I ask myself questions like, uh, what about famous constants? What are their count and set uh, columns? So I began with E. Uh, I don't know if I began with it, but I certainly explored it. And uh, this was what it looked like. Now, um, on the left, 3, 1, 3, 4, 1, 6, 1, 8. On the right, something came out that looked very interesting. 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 5, 2, 7, 2. And being a naive 16 or 17 year old at this point, I said, oh my god, the primes. <laughs> you have to understand that this was at the, at the time, uh, in other words, it was twos alternating with primes. Two, 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 three, two, five. If it, I wouldn't have jumped to that conclusion, you understand, if it said two, one, two, three, two, five, two, seven. But it didn't start out two, one, two, three. It started out two, 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 three, two, five. It was as if God was handing me the primes on a silver flag. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, uh, well, I guess it makes it transparent. I should explain. Good enough. <laughs> that was my reaction. Okay. Now, again, this, I was working on a computer that had about 10 digits of accuracy. So I was losing accuracy. I knew I was losing about a digit per descent. So pretty soon, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to trust the thing. And I had to get out a triple precision arithmetic, arithmetic uh, function thing. It was a package of cards. Of course, it's all done on cards. A package of cards, like 300 cards long, that was in machine language that you would put behind your program. And you would have to re rewrite the program so the word had a plus sign before you would then say something like triple plus of the two arguments. Uh, and you have to write things in this, in this complicated way. But you could get it to do arithmetic in triple precision. And so I got it to do arithmetic in triple precision. Um, and, uh, and then that's what came out. The odd numbers, except for God, God made a mistake at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, and so it's 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 5, 2, 7, 2, 9, 2, 11. But if you're an engineer, it's still okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, it was, it, was, uh, it was exciting and disappointing at the same time. There was beauty, but there was sort of a, a, obviously a big disappointment. But this was the kind of thing that I was very hooked on, and uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that uh, led me to, uh, it led me on to, to make more exploration. Now, what I wanted to talk about is, is uh, the, um, what I talked, uh, mentioned earlier that the square root of 2 and 5, the golden ratio, were sort of complementary numbers. That is, the set column of 1 was the count column of the other, and vice versa. So the question is, what would be the complementary number to E? What number, what, what real number, which would be between 2 and 3, but it would be closer to 2 now than to 3, would have this be its set column and this be its count column. What real number would have that property? And in general, for any alpha, what real number would have the property that it's, there would be some other number that would have the property that it was the flip, what I call the int. So that was my notion that if uh, int is when the count of one is the set of, count column of one is the set column of the other, and vice and versa. Okay, so obviously it's a function of its own, its own inverse, and that was my definition for hint. And um, so, and again, as, a, as an empirical mathematician, I plotted uh, all the points that I knew, and I got a picture that looked something like that. That was my first graph of int, um, just a handful of points, or a couple of handfuls. Um, and uh, I could see some kind of structure there, but I didn't know quite what to make it. The line is just y plus x, but it's the dots that are the, the interesting graph there. Between, this is the int between 1 and 2. Um, between 2 and 3, it would look identical. 
because it's, it's just the whole thing is just transported up so periodically. You just move to the right and move up. So it, what it does between any pair of successive integers is all that matters. So um, this was my first graph, and then I uh, I asked the computer to give me some more points. And I, uh, well, I guess this is maybe not more points, but I just sort of drew a wiggly line. No, I guess it has a few more points. It has a few more points up in, the, up in, up in this zone here, I, I guess. I, so I, I probably added that, another 10 points here. And I got some wiggles. And I was curious about this kind of wiggly function. And so I wanted to know what happens here up in, well, I can either point up there or down here. I wanted to know what happens down in the corner because I, didn't have a, a clear sense of it. So uh, I got more numbers. Oh, this was number crunching. There were no plotters. There were no plotters at all. Uh, so I, I got out the numbers, and, and, I, and I saw more wiggles. And uh, so I was interested. It seemed like I was getting it had some sort of wiggly thing by the tail. Um, well, to make a long story short, uh, when you plot it, this is much done much later. This is done in the 80s. I was just trying to reconstruct what I this is done on the map. Um, I was just trying to reconstruct what I did back then. And I and I and I got graphs that were of increasing um, increasing uh, amounts of uh, precision, not precision, but uh, fine grain. And so I could see that it looked as if it was composed of structures, of sort of a, a pattern here and a pattern here sort of a, a, a line and, and things like that. So I was interested in knowing, I'm looking at the structure of each of the parts, so like that. So I would then have the computer explore that area in more detail, and it looked like that. Uh, and then I was interested in knowing, what does that look like? And it looked like that. And so I caught on at this point that I was dealing with a structure that was basically these it, it was composed of copies of itself, but the copies were slightly distorted. They were kind of uh, warped, you might say. Um, and here is a, a more detailed graph where you can sort of appreciate the structure, and you can see what it looks like, and you can uh, easily imagine exactly how it is. And this was very intoxicating to me when I was uh, on the order of 17 or 18. And uh, uh, so, uh, I, 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 know, I, I asked myself some questions at this point. Uh, uh, one question was, well, int of any rational number, to define it for rationals is a little tricky. But you can define it for rationals. An int for any rational number is another rational number. That's a trivial thing. It's sort of the second that count sequences are finite. And so you run out of gas, and then you interchange them, and you work backwards, and you get a rational number. So then, for it, it turns out also that the the set and the count sequences are actually intimately related to continued fractions. They're cousins of continued fractions. They're um, um, which I'm not going to go into. But but some of the theorems that uh, are hold for continued fractions also hold for these things which is that if you are dealing with a quadratic number, such as the square root of 2 or 5, then the count and step sequence are periodic. Uh, they repeat. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is a very, very short period. Uh, but they can be longer, but they will eventually, for any quadratic, they will repeat. Uh, and, uh, and so if you interchange them, they're still periodic. And so if you work backwards, you get a quadratic as in. So if the int if alpha is quadratic, then it's if alpha is quadratic. So I want to know what is the case uh, for a cubic or for a, uh, uh, a transcendental number, what are, you know, or just in general, an algebraic number. So I, I put in cube, cube root of 2, and I took int of it to, uh, I don't know, many decimals, probably triple precision. I probably got out. Uh, 15 or 20 decimals, I don't know. And then I tried, then I, being an empirical mathematician, I then substituted it into a whole bunch of, uh, of, of uh, cubic polynomials with integer coefficients. Uh, systematically, I mean, you know, I, I generated, I had a program that generated these polynomials and then stuck this number in to see if it was cubic. 
And it never seemed to be too big. It never came out to zero. Um, and so this was very puzzling to me. I, I thought, 